Today I want to talk to you about an idea that means a great deal to me. And I hope that, that by sharing with you, I can inspire your drawing or maybe even inspire you to start drawing if you never have done it before. And this idea is, it's the whole reason that I started to draw myself about 25 years ago. And the reason that I keep working in my sketchbook nearly every day. Well, I want to talk to you about the true value that we can get out of making art. And that's a value that, that can change your life, that can make you happy, that can connect you with the whole world. I know that sounds like a big claim and possibly over the top. It might sound like that, but I think you'll understand in a little bit why I think it's absolutely true. So I want to discuss what we're doing when we sit down to create something. And why? Why are we doing this? Why do we draw? Um, what do we hope to get out of doing it? Is our objective just to learn how to draw better? And if so, then why? I mean, why is that a good objective to have, to, to just have these skills, these drawing skills, and to just make them better? I mean, are, are we all trying to become professionals? I'm not. Are we trying to impress other people? I'm probably not either. But what are the things that we might be getting out of making stuff that makes it worth all the effort that it takes to get better and better at it? It's a lot of work. What's the payoff? So a few years ago, I wrote this book. It's called Art Before Breakfast. And what I was trying to get at with the title of the book was that art making can be something that you can just make an everyday part of your life. Just something you do. It doesn't have to be something you have like a big special studio or huge amounts of equipment set up for waiting for you. You don't have to quit your job. You don't have to wait until you retire. You don't have to take lots of classes. You don't have to get degrees. You can just start making art today and you can integrate it into your life in this seamless way. It's kind of like the way that the kids do, the way that the kids make art in their daily lives when they're playing in their schoolwork. Drawing is just a natural part of our experience as human beings. So this book, Art Before Breakfast, it starts with the idea of what kind of art could you make before breakfast when you're the only person awake in your house, when you're maybe still half asleep, perhaps when you don't have a lot of time to do this thing. Well, let's start with just the subject matter. What are you going to draw? I mean, well, one obvious subject to me, obvious to me at least, was to draw myself. And that's why drawing self-portraits is, I think, a really important type of skill-building practice to draw yourself. You're right there. You're the model. But it's also a way of checking in with myself first thing in the morning. It's kind of like a form of journaling with drawing. I sit down, there's my sketchbook, and I look at myself and I say, how are you today? And the drawing helps me to figure that out. But then I also thought about other things about being up early, like you're waiting to have breakfast, you're, you're in the kitchen, right? Maybe you're waiting for the kettle to boil or something. So you could just draw the other objects in the kitchen, right? You could, you could draw the view out the window. Um, now you might think to yourself, well, these subjects are all pretty mundane. You don't see that in a museum. Why would I want to have drawings of this stuff in my kitchen? Why draw a teacup? Why draw a potato masher? Why draw a microwave oven? What's the point? Why are we doing this? Now, this is another book, and you might have heard of this one. Maybe you even read it. It's this huge bestseller, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up by Marie Kondo. And the idea of this book is that you should have a meaningful relationship with the objects that you own. And invariably, because of the kind of consumer culture that we live in, we end up just having too much stuff and it overwhelms us. And what Marie Kondo is saying is that 
you should go through every single thing that you own, everything, object by object, and you should take each one and you should say, does this bring me joy? Now, initially that might seem sort of a strange thought. This pair of socks, does it bring me joy? This ballpoint pen, does it bring me joy? But she says that they must, or out they go. If that thing that you're holding doesn't bring you joy, you have to get rid of it. Bye-bye, potato masher. See you, floss dispenser. Hasta la vista, orange running shoes that never really felt comfortable. You don't need them. They're not making your life better. You don't love them? Get rid of them. And I think it's kind of an interesting exercise. It can be taken to extremes. I tried it a bit and decluttered somewhat, but it just kept making me think, you know? Now, what does this tidying up have to do with drawing? Well, let me tell you about another thing, speaking of Japan. In Japan, they also have this wonderful idea that's called wabi-sabi. Wabi-sabi is about this, this very kind of Zen idea that life and everything in it is transient and that everything changes, right? So, and how certain objects can also remind us that we, our lives, are also fleeting and impermanent. And also that that's actually a good thing and that we can treasure it. We don't need to cling to things to find happiness. And Wabi Sabi is also about imperfection. Imperfection is a natural state of being. Imperfection is beautiful and it's valuable. And so Japanese will have these vases and teacups that have cracks in them. And then they'll put gold in the cracks to, to heighten the damage, the, the, the imperfections, and emphasize that they're unique and that these objects are vulnerable, just like we are. This is what the author Richard Powell says. Wabi Sabi nurtures all that is authentic by acknowledging three simple realities. Nothing lasts, nothing is finished, and nothing is perfect. I think you could say the same thing about drawing, right? Three simple realities. Nothing lasts, nothing's finished, nothing's perfect. Imagine if we wrote that in our sketchbooks on the very first page, and then our sketchbooks became places for us to reaffirm this idea that time passes by, and we can't cling to things, that everything is a process. It's not about reaching some end goal, because that end is death. And nothing that exists is perfect. Perfection isn't the goal. And too often we tell ourselves that perfection is all that matters. Andrew Jupiter is another author, and he says, if an object or an expression can bring about within us a sense of serene melancholy and a spiritual longing, that object could be said to be wabi-sabi. Serene melancholy, spiritual longing. It's a little goth. I'm not sure I want to be burdened with that all the time, but I think acknowledging life's impermanence and fragility, it makes sense. It doesn't have to mean that drawing in your sketchbook has to be like going to church or something, but if you think about it as this morning practice, it can have this function. It can be a regular practice of just connecting with the meaning in our life. And that meaning could be serene and melancholy, but it could also be a lot of other things. Let's take an object that I wanted to think about. What is this connection that I have with this object? It can have feelings and memories that are connected to it, to that, to that um, object. It could be that generally when I look at, uh, at a butter knife, <laughs> I feel joy. Or it could be that this particular butter knife belonged to my grandmother. And when I look at this object, or I interact with it, those feelings and memories come to me. They're activated by the object. It unlocks them. And what really matters isn't the object, it's the feelings and it's the memories that it 
rings up in me. And so when I sit down to draw in my sketchbook, what happens is that those feelings and those memories are heightened because of this whole meditative aspect of drawing, of really contemplating something, being connected, being present, being there, and putting down ink on paper. Spending some time really deeply engaging with this thing that you're drawing. And it's richer and deeper because of it, of this communion that you had with it, right? That's part of my experience. That's the thing that's really meaningful to me in doing all this. The drawing experience is heightening the feelings, feelings that are coming to me from this object. And so the next thing that happens is I'm invested with these feelings, and these feelings are in me. And when I draw, when I draw that object, somehow those feelings are being transferred into my drawing. The drawing itself becomes an object, and the drawing now contains those feelings and memories too. It goes they're somehow in the drawing in a way that they're channeled through me and into that page. And you may not know that you're doing that when you're doing it, but it is being transferred into your sketchbook. Those feelings are. You might have had the experience that if you're drawing on a vacation, say on a trip, and later on you look at that drawing and it reminds you of being in Paris. And it reminds you, not just the fact that you were there, but it reminds you of the, of the very particular morning when you went to visit Notre Dame and you were, I don't know, slightly hungry and the, the sky was overcast and you were in a bit of a rush and there were a lot of crowds, but you were in awe of the fact that you were finally seeing Notre Dame, this, this amazing cathedral, and that you'd always read about it in books, and now it's all there in that drawing. All those feelings that you have about being there in Notre Dame, they're in that drawing, in that moment that you were doing it. And this drawing, from a technical standpoint, it might be I don't know, pretty incidental, but again, like those cracked pots that the Japanese make, its power is the emotion that's invested in it more than it is about any particular technical drawing accomplishment. So the next thing that happens is this drawing, this object that has in it this feeling that's been recorded in it, its power can also spread. Somebody else comes along and they look at this drawing and, and that's some, that somebody else could be you. It could be you in the future, months or years from now, coming back and looking at this drawing again. Or it could be your children. You pass away and your children look at that drawing. Or it could be your friend that you show it to. Or it could be that some strangers look at it years from now. And what do they experience when they look at it? Well, those feelings and those memories that you had are stored and then unleashed in that drawing. I'm sure you've had this experience when you go and look at art in a museum. And you look at, say, Van Gogh's sunflowers. And you feel the feelings that are coming out of it. It's not just some oil paint on an old piece of rough fabric. It's not just this painting of some flowers. It has emotion embedded in it. Van Gogh was particularly good at that. And this emotion is coming out. And the next thing that happens is you have this intensified feeling. And this moment these feelings can be distinct from the object. So you can walk away from that painting and you can still have that feeling. And you can think about that feeling the next day or the next month, months later maybe, right? And you can say, I'll always remember when I saw Van Gogh's sunflowers. I felt this intense feeling and I remember that feeling. And that could be true of any piece of art that you make. It could be true of one of your kids' drawings that you remember those feelings that you had when they were little and they're somehow conveyed in that drawing. And so those associations, but also somehow some kind of energy. I don't know, it sounds a little woo-woo, but if we take all of these things, this original object, right, and then the artist who made the drawing, and then the drawing itself, and then the viewer, and then the feelings and the memories. You take all these things, and what matters most is the communication between the maker and the viewer, and the transmission of these feelings and memories. 
And the true value isn't that it's this famous painting in the gold frame. It's the response that it evokes and this connection between you in the 21st century and Van Gogh 200 years before, or you and an earlier version of you, or you and your grandchildren who are going to look at this drawing years from now, that connection is intensified because it's the link between the two of you. And it enhances both people's lives. It makes life better. It makes life richer. And I think about how often we neglect this notion because we're thinking too much about the technical challenge that we have in doing the drawing. We're thinking too much about whether my watercolors are working or did I catch the light on that or is that rendering, is the nose too big? <laughs> and if you have a lot of anxiety around this act of drawing or painting, if you're worried that you're doing a terrible job, if you're feeling incompetent, if you're struggling with all this stuff, then that those feelings are very powerful. That anxiety, that self-doubt, they're going to overwhelm anything else. And those are the things that are going to be captured and possibly conveyed in that drawing. And the quality of your line is not going to be confident. And the way that you pick colors is going to be affected by this psychological state that you're in. You see how all this stuff is going into that drawing. So part of our job as artists is to be authentic and to be true to our objective. And our objective is to capture this moment in ourselves, this moment that we're having while we look at this thing and to transmit it and to put it down on paper. This is one of the first books that I wrote. It's called Everyday Matters. And this book is about my learning the same lesson about these things. This is the, the second or second drawing, I think, in the book. And this is my, well, this is my son's toy. And, um, but actually, it became my dog Frank's toy. And they would fight over it, and then Frank won. And this became my dog's bunny puppet for a long time. But I just look at this, and you can see how it got worn away, and it's eaten up. And I wrote here, Frank's bunny much abused, mutilated, chewed, and saliva soaked. But I look at this bunny that I haven't seen in ages, and this dog that I haven't seen in 20 years, and I have these strong feelings coming from this drawing, even though I have no idea where that bunny is. And Frank, I have no idea what or where he is now either. When I first started to draw, drawings like this, uh, a stocked pantry in my house, or this IV bag from the hospital, or this armchair, which was the rocker that we had in my son's room. And, and when my wife was in the hospital, my son was really little, and I would sit in this armchair with him every night rocking while she's in the hospital. And I'm just looking at this drawing of this, this thing with this yogurt stain. And, you know, again, it's just, it's just a powerful memory that comes back to me. Is it a great drawing? Eh. But it's a precious one. This drawing of this medicine cabinet reminds me of the very first drawings that I was doing, trying to capture learning to draw and, and struggling and trying to slow down and just really be present and, and declutterify my brain of all the crazy anxieties that I was having. And I spent a lot of time drawing all these tiny little things in our house, like my son's cowboy boots or his toys or every single one of the pillows that we had stretched along the window, so every one of them. And, you know, in retrospect, so glad that I did. I'm so glad that I spent the time doing that because my life is so removed from those experiences, you know, decades ago. But, and my son, he's a grown man. He lives in Los Angeles. And, and my first wife, she's passed away. So these are all things that remind me of them. And those moments like this tiny eyelash curler thingy or this little chatelaine that used to belong to Patty's grandmother, even just this can of Chef Boyardee. But actually, my memory of this was that my second stepfather he was pretty abusive to me and once he hit me and i had a red handprint on my face and i had to go to school like that and that evening he brought me this can of chef boyardee or spaghettios or something and until then that had been kind of a treat to have but this can of junk food became his sort of apology i guess and when i originally drew it in my book i didn't mention that whole story and but I'm telling you now, because when I look at it, I know exactly why I drew 
that can and what it means. It's sort of my secret to me now. I'm sharing it with you. And so many of these objects, they're just packed with memory. And that's the power to me of creating an illustrated journal in a sketchbook, of trying to go deeper with your life, trying to commemorate and memorialize what you've gone through to keep it forever because you'll never have these memories as clearly and freshly as when you're drawing, intensely thinking, gazing, being here now. This is a cookie jar that's shaped like a teddy bear. So I wrote this book, Everyday Matters, after Patty's accident. And that's why she was in the hospital. She had an accident. And I wrote this book about how drawing helped me to, to make sense of everything that had happened. But then I did this other book, and it's called A Kiss Before You Go. And I wrote this one after Patty passed away years later. And here's that same teddy bear cookie jar again. And this teddy bear became the urn for Patty's ashes. And so obviously this teddy bear that had always been a cute, memorable part of our household, now it took on even more meaning to me. And so do both of these drawings now because of those feelings that I had. And you can see the difference in how I drew the cookie jar originally and how I now came back to paint it and the difference in the way that I looked and saw and the other feelings and emotions that came off it to me. Now look, this may not be the role that art plays in your life. You might say to yourself, look, I just want to make some cool pictures. I, I don't need to have all this emotional content in what I'm making. But I think it's, it's hard to avoid. I think if you do this on a regular basis and it becomes integrated into your life, it's hard to avoid the moments of your life starting to seep into the drawings that you're doing. But it can, and it should, and it's so much more valuable. And you can do this with your very next drawing. Even if you're just beginning to draw, your very first drawing can have that emotional content if you let it, if you allow yourself to be present, if you allow yourself to realize that this is what art is truly about, about being more alive, about being more aware, about being more present, about seeing the incredible beauty that the world has, about feeling things as intensely as you can, as getting as much as you can out of every day. And being able to somehow encapsulate those feelings, condense them so you can access them again. Some of them are going to be hard feelings, painful feelings, sorrow, guilt, loss, but it's so much better to experience them, process them, absorb them into yourself than it is to suppress them, deny them, escape them. Making art is about being a human being in the most meaningful and full way you can. It's not about drawing things that look perfect. It's not about taking classes. It's not about making money. It's not about getting attention. It's about living your life as richly as you can. And I hope that you'll get yourself a sketchbook, get yourself a pen, and give it a try.